Thomas Hobbes is the greatest political thinker to have written in the English language. Along with Plato and Hegel, Hobbes is one of the three great political thinkers in the Western political tradition. Today's lecture is not going to give a full account of Hobbes' political theory. I'm going to focus on a narrower part of Hobbes' writing, namely what he has to say about war between states. I'm going to make the argument that Hobbes is the greatest political thinker to contribute to the topic of pacifism. Seek peace is the motto of Hobbes' political writings. Let me begin with a few comments about Hobbes' life and the context in which he, he wrote his, his great works. Thomas Hobbes was born in Malmesbury, England in 1588. So he was born under the, the reign of Elizabeth I. He lived a long, varied life which brought him into contact with many of the great intellectuals of Europe. And he died in 1679. He wrote his two great works of political theory, De Kive in 1640, and his more famous Leviathan in 1651, against the backdrop of a civil war in both England and more generally in Europe. You are probably familiar with the Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648 that ripped apart uh, European societies. I want to start by reading you a passage from um, the epistle dedicatory um, of De Kive and it uh, frames the topic of today's lecture. Um, there are two maxims which are surely both true. Man is a god to man and man is a wolf to man. The former is true of the relations of citizens with each other. The latter of relations between commonwealths or states as we would call them. In justice and charity, the virtues of peace, citizens show some likeness to God. But between commonwealths, the wickedness of bad men compels the good too to have recourse for their own protection to the virtues of war, which are violence and fraud, i.e., to the predatory nature of beasts. Notice there that Hobbes draws a distinction between the relations that are possible within the Commonwealth or within the state and the relations that pertain between states. Man is a god to man. Basically what Hobbes is saying is that we have it within ourselves to form peaceful relations with our fellow citizens. Man is a wolf to man. But, here's the downside, we don't have it within ourselves to form peaceful relations between different states. International war is going to remain a problem even though domestic war, civil war, the war that Hobbes is confronting in the context of his own life, can be ended. We are not such predatory beasts that we can't achieve civil order. Now that raises a question. Okay, if we have it within ourselves to form domestic peace, why can't we get it together 
to form international peace. What's going on here? Here it's useful to take a look at another passage from the Epistle Dedicatory to De Kivi. It's a passage that comes just one page later than the one that I read earlier. For if the patterns of human action were known with the same certainty as the relations of magnitude in figures, ambition and greed, whose power rests on the false opinions of the common people about right and wrong, would be disarmed, and the human race would enjoy such secure peace that it seems unlikely that it would ever have to fight again. That passage suggests that our current failures to achieve peace are remediable. We simply need to change people's opinions. In order to clarify this, I think, absolutely central feature of Hobbes's argument, it might be useful to draw a distinction between three different ways that organised societies can fail to achieve desired goals. First, cognitive failure. Societies simply lack the knowledge or possess the wrong ideas about what needs to be done. Second, institutional failure. Organised societies might simply have the wrong institutions to achieve a desired goal. They might even know they have the wrong institutions, but those institutions are locked in place by political and economic powers. Third, hard-rooted behavioural failures. It might be the case that certain desired goals are beyond our reach because of human nature. When it comes to war, I think Hobbes is much less pessimistic and bleak than, say, a thinker like Freud. And it might be useful, just for a moment, to contrast Hobbes' argument about war with the argument that Freud puts forward in Civilization and its discontents. So what is Hobbes' theory of human nature? And how does it relate to the causes of war? Well, Hobbes lays out his theory of human nature in its most graphic form by way of a structural contrast between life without a government and life with a government. Before I spell out the details of this part of Hobbes' argument, I invite you to consider the following hypothetical. Imagine you received a text, right now, from the Chancellor of the University. The text said, Dear student, the Syracuse City Police and the Department of Public Safety and all law enforcement officials in the state are going on a 24-hour strike. You are on your own. Good luck. What do you think would happen in the ensuing 24 hours? What do you think would happen if, as a footnote to that letter, that text, it was said that any crimes committed in the next 24 hours would, be, um, would go without punishment? Do you think that the ensuing 24 hours would be peaceful? Or do you think that the ensuing 24 hours would be violent conflict? All-out war against all? Would you take, would you, for example, would you, for example, take back to your dorm room, bar the door and read books? Or would you pick up a crowbar? and head for the nearest liquor store. Or more alarmingly, head for the nearest econ professor who's just given you a C. (sighs) 
Like all political theorists, Thomas Hobbes has a theory of human nature. Simply stated, he draws a distinction between our passions and our capacity for reason. Some of our passions, like ambition and greed, can lead us into conflict. However, we also possess other passions that can lead us towards peace. The two passions that are most important so far as peace is concerned are one, our desire for a commodious life, which is to say our desire for a comfortable life. Second, our fear. For Hobbes, human beings are absolutely terrified of one thing, namely violent death. That is the one thing that we all share in common, above all else. We are terrified of violent death and we will do more or less anything to escape violent death. So here's the problem. In the absence of government, we find ourselves in this state of nature, this state where we are confronted with the constant threat of violence and are constantly fearful of losing our life. We will do anything to get out of that state if we can. Fortunately, and this is where the optimism of Hobbes comes through, fortunately, human beings are equipped with the capacity for reason. They have the cognitive ability to figure out what to do to get out of this awful state, this state of nature where they confront violent conflict. Hobbes conceptualizes that rational capacity we have in terms of certain precepts of reason, which he also refers to as laws of nature. The first precept of reason, the first law of nature, in its simplest form is seek the peace. 